Due importanti eventi si sono succeduti ai primi di marzo a Oslo in Norvegia. Incentrati sullo studio e la divulgazione degli effetti catastrofici umanitari, medici e ambientali che un conflitto nucleare, anche locale, causerebbe in vastissime aree del pianeta. Ed ecco allora il 4 e 5 marzo l'importante conferenza organizzata dal Ministero degli Esteri norvegese Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons, popolata dai rappresentanti di quasi 130 nazioni. Mentre nei giorni immediatamente precedenti, ecco la due giorni del Forum Internazionale della Società Civile, preparato da ICANN, che ha visto partecipare numerosissimi esponenti di associazioni, organizzazioni e movimenti. Ed è un peccato che i media nostrani fossero tutti presi dalle vicende e dai litigi post-elettorali, come pure dal Toto Fontefice, che il dare un occhio a questi eventi sarebbe stato utile e importante. Il pericolo di un'estinzione dell'umanità e di numerosissime specie animali è tuttora concreto e che ne pensino gli ottimisti. Anche se gli stati non mettessero mai mano alle procedure di innesco e di lancio, Beh, un falso allarme con reazione immediata dell'altra parte minacciata, minacciata per errore causerebbe per davvero il disastro. Unica soluzione? Bandire per sempre tutti gli ordini. I want to talk to you today about the medical consequences of nuclear war. Since the end of the Cold War, we have acted as though the problem of nuclear war has gone away. Unfortunately, it hasn't. There remain in the world today nearly 20,000 nuclear warheads, the vast majority, 95%, in the arsenals of the United States and Russia. And so it is terribly important that we understand what will happen if these weapons are used. During the Cold War, we all understood that if there was a large war between the US and the Soviet Union, it would be a disaster not just for them, but for the entire planet. In recent years, we have come to understand that even a much more limited nuclear war, as might take place between India and Pakistan, would also be a disaster for all humanity. We have examined a scenario in which India and Pakistan fight uh, using about 50 Hiroshima-sized bombs on either side, with these weapons targeted at urban areas. The immediate consequences in South Asia are catastrophic. Something between 20 and 30 million people die in the first few weeks from radiation, from fire, from blast. But as horrific as these local consequences are, it's the global climate disruption that is really terrifying. Because it turns out that the firestorms started by these weapons cause more than 5 million tons of debris to be lofted into the upper atmosphere, where they block out sunlight, causing temperatures across the planet to drop an average of 1.3 degrees centigrade. This shortens the growing season, cuts down on precipitation, and this disrupts food production. In the last year, we have learned that under this scenario, U.S. corn production would fall about 12%, and this decline would last for a full decade. Chinese middle-season rice production would drop nearly 15%, and this too would persist for a whole decade. And some preliminary studies that are just now being done suggest that corn production in China and wheat production in China might drop even more. The world is very ill-prepared at this time to deal with this kind of decline in food production. The granaries of the world hold only a reserve amounting to about 70 days of consumption, and this simply would not be an adequate buffer. In addition, there are 870 million people in the world who are malnourished today at baseline. These people receive less than 1,800 calories a day. This is just enough to maintain their body mass and to let them do a little bit of work to gather food, to grow food. There are also 300 million people in the world who get pretty good nutrition today, but live in countries that are very dependent on food imports. In the event of a limited nuclear war and a significant decline in food production, all of these people, more than a billion people total, would be at risk of starvation. This data 
has profound implications for nuclear weapons policy. It tells us that it is not just the arsenals of the great powers that put the whole world at risk, but even the smaller nuclear arsenals of countries like India and Pakistan. And this has obviously immense implications for nuclear weapons policy in South Asia. But it also has huge implications for the nuclear weapons policies of the United States and Russia. Each US Trident submarine carries 96 warheads, each of which is 10 to 30 times more powerful than the bombs used in the nuclear famine scenario that I've just discussed. That means that each Trident submarine is capable of causing the nuclear famine problem many times over. And the United States has 14 of them. And that's just one third of the US arsenal because the US also has ground-based missiles and airplanes to deliver gravity bombs. The Russian arsenal has the same extreme overkill capacity. And so we need to know what will happen if these weapons are actually used. I want to start by describing what happens to one city in a large-scale nuclear attack. And I'm going to use the model of a 20 megaton bomb. Now, back in the 1960s, both the United States and the Soviet Union had 20 megaton bombs in their arsenals. Since then, the arsenals have been modernized. And a modern attack on Moscow or New York would involve not one 20 megaton bomb, but perhaps 15 to 20 half megaton bombs. The megatonnage would be less, but the destruction would be even greater because it would be spread out more efficiently over the entire metropolitan area. It's difficult, though, to visualize 15 to 20 bombs going off all at the same time. And so the model of a single 20 megaton bomb even though it tends to underestimate the destruction, serves as an adequate approximation for our purposes. Within a thousandth of a second of the detonation of this bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, temperatures would rise to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun, and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the people, the trees, the upper level of the earth itself. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the blast would generate winds in excess of 600 miles per hour and blast pressures greater than 25 pounds per square inch. Forces of this magnitude can destroy anything that human beings can build. Underground shelters would collapse. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobile sheet metal would melt. To a distance of 10 miles in every direction, the blast would still generate winds in excess of 200 miles per hour and blast pressures greater than 10 pounds per square inch. Forces of this magnitude would level wood frame buildings, masonry buildings. A modern steel and concrete building would see its walls and floors swept out. Just the steel skeleton would remain. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Wood, paper, cloth, heating oil, gasoline, it would all ignite. Hundreds of thousands of fires, which would, over the next half hour, coalesce into a giant firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. All the oxygen would be consumed and every living thing would die. Beyond this great firestorm, the destruction would continue and there would be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people suffering severe injuries, crush injuries, penetrating injuries, extensive burns, blindness from retinal burning. All of these people would need intensive medical care but it would not be available because most of the hospitals would be destroyed, most of the doctors and nurses and other health professionals would be dead, there'd be no electricity to run the ventilators and the cardiac monitors, most of the medical supplies would be exhausted within hours, and the vast majority of these people would not receive any medical care at all. They would die alone and in great pain. And if this attack were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this level of destruction would be visited on every metropolitan area in the United States and in Russia. A study which Physicians for Social Responsibility published in 2003 showed that if just 300 of the warheads in the Russian arsenal detonated over urban targets in the United States, something between 75 and 100 million people would die in the first half hour. In addition, 
the entire economic infrastructure would be destroyed. The transportation system, the communications network, the public health system, all the things that a modern industrial country requires to maintain its population, all of these things would be gone. And it is probable that in the ensuing months, the vast majority of the American and Russian population, those who were not killed outright in the first half hour of the attack, they too would die from starvation, from exposure, from epidemic disease, from radiation poisoning. As unimaginable as these direct consequences are, they are not the worst part of the story. Here too, it is the environmental consequences that we need to really look at. A limited war in South Asia puts 5 million tons of debris into the atmosphere and drops global temperatures 1.3 degrees. A large war between the United States and Russia, using only those weapons which are still allowed to them when the New START Treaty is fully implemented in 2018, that war puts 150 million tons of debris into the upper atmosphere and it drops temperatures across the globe an average of 8 degrees centigrade. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperature drop is even greater, up to 30 degrees centigrade. Earth has not seen conditions like this since the coldest point of the last ice age 18,000 years ago. And under these conditions, all food production, all agriculture would come to a halt. The vast majority of the human race would starve to death, and it is possible that our species would become extinct. It is important that we understand this is not just some nightmare fantasy that I have cooked up to scare you. This is a real and present danger. As long as the nuclear weapons exist, there exists the possibility they will be used. The United States and Russia, between them, maintain several thousand warheads on high alert. They are mounted on rockets which can be launched in 15 minutes and destroy the other country 30 minutes later. This is not normal behavior. This is not the way nations which are securely at peace with each other treat each other. Even if there is not a deliberate use of these weapons, there remains under these conditions the very real possibility that there will be an accidental war. We know of at least five occasions since 1979 when either Washington or Moscow prepared to launch a nuclear attack in the mistaken belief that it itself was under attack. And the most recent of these took place on January 25, 1995, a full five years after the end of the Cold War. The conditions which existed then have not changed substantially, and the danger of an accidental nuclear war is still with us, a scenario like the one which unfolded then and which brought us to within minutes of nuclear holocaust could unfold as we are sitting here today. I've done something really terrible by telling you all of these things. And it goes beyond just darkening this particular day in your life. Because once you know about this information, you have an obligation to act on it. Fortunately, there are things that people can do. A movement is forming around the world to abolish nuclear weapons. The International Red Cross Red Crescent Movement has called for the abolition of nuclear weapons, and national Red Cross Red Crescent societies around the globe are organizing educational campaigns to teach people about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear war. International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and its national affiliates like Physicians for Social Responsibility in the United States are continuing their work educating leaders and the general public about the medical consequences of nuclear war. And governments are beginning to listen. In the fall of 2012, 34 nations and the Holy See joined together in a statement calling for the abolition of all nuclear weapons and calling on the nuclear weapon states to take seriously their obligations under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to negotiate a treaty abolishing these weapons forever. The normal reaction that each of you is going to have is to try to forget the things which I've talked about today. This is very difficult material, and it's very painful to think about it. Please, don't do that. Try to remember this message, and try to act on it. Each one of us has a role to play in building an international movement to abolish nuclear weapons. In the Hebrew Bible, it is written that God said, Behold, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your children might live. 
That is literally the choice before humanity today. And so let us all choose wisely and act with courage and determination so that indeed our children might live. Bene, ritorniamo noi. Il filmato appena trasmesso è stato prodotto come mezzo di divulgazione scientifica. Avrete notato oltretutto l'assenza di emotività nella descrizione, oltre che di preparazione a questi due importanti eventi che, come si è detto, si sono svolti all'inizio del mese a Oslo, in Norvegia. Che cos'è la campagna ICANN? ICANN, campagna internazionale per la messa al bando delle armi nucleari, è un movimento globale di base a favore del disarmo nucleare totale attraverso una convenzione sulle armi nucleari legalmente vincolante e sottoponibile a verifica. Scopo del trattato è mettere al bando la produzione, i test, l'utilizzo e il possesso di armi nucleari e stabilire un termine entro il quale giungere alla loro eliminazione. Il lancio della campagna ICANN è avvenuto nel 2007 da parte dell'International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW, una federazione globale di professionisti nel campo della medicina. Oggi più di 200 organizzazioni in 50 paesi fanno parte di ICANN. E migliaia di persone ne hanno sottoscritto l'impegno per un mondo libero dalle armi nucleari. When the Berlin Wall fell, people celebrated in the streets as the dark shroud which had covered Europe for more than four decades was finally lifted, rays of hope spread to people in other regions that a new era of peace was possible. But busy as we were moving on with our lives and connecting with the world, from paging to texting to tweeting, we began to forget that the biggest threat of the Cold War, the nuclear weapons that had threatened our very existence, had not vanished, and their legacy is still causing victims today. Since their invention in 1945, nuclear weapons have twice been detonated over cities. In a few minutes, bright flashes envelop the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, marking the beginning of the nuclear era. The citizens of Hiroshima and Nagasaki experienced the devastating effects of a weapon so terrible and sweeping in its destructive power that it could not be targeted to avoid killing massive numbers of civilians. A weapon unable to distinguish between a building and an infant. Survivors faced the trauma of radiation exposure. They faced injuries for which doctors had no cure. They faced a lifetime of stigma and prejudice and the knowledge that they also suffer the effects of the nuclear fallout. So I looked around and I saw the procession of ghostly figures. I say ghostly figures because 
they simply did not look like human beings. Their bodies were burned, blackened, and swollen, and skin and flesh were hanging from the bones. Hair was standing up towards the sky, and some people were carrying their eye eyeballs in their hands. In Kazakhstan, nuclear weapons continued to be detonated until 1989. The blast left a dark legacy of cancer and birth defects. My mother died of stomach cancer. She was severely disabled. We realized the reason much later because my mother had two children before me who did not live up to one year, dying one after the other. If a nuclear detonation occurred in a city today, international and national relief agencies would be helpless. The International Committee of the Red Cross has said that no appropriate response could be put in place by any state or humanitarian organization. Neither the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement worldwide nor any international agency has currently the capacity to provide adequate assistance to the victims of the use of nuclear weapons. You know, logistics, training, and material is available around the world for weapons that are currently in use, conventional weapons, explosives, and bullets. But as regards uh, the effects of nuclear weapons, particularly the radiation effects, this capacity hardly exists. The detonation of a nuclear weapon would cause unparalleled environmental pollution. Cancers, birth defects, genetic damage, lowered immunity to diseases. These are only some of the potential effects of nuclear testing and nuclear fallout. What makes catastrophic nuclear accidents truly monstrous is that the impacts cannot be cleaned or erased. The contamination created by radiation will impact not only those living now, but also future generations. There are no technologies capable of effectively cleaning up radiation. In 1945, two nuclear weapon detonations generated a humanitarian catastrophe on a previously unimaginable scale. Today, with 19,000 nuclear weapons around, the chances of one of them being used either intentionally or by a human or mechanical error has increased exponentially. The other weapons of mass destruction, chemical and biological weapons, have both already been clearly banned by international treaties. The humanitarian effects and the detonation of a nuclear weapon should leave us in no doubt that nuclear weapons must be outlawed also. Every existing nuclear warhead has the potential to unleash a humanitarian catastrophe and create immeasurable suffering for humans, the environment and our societies. Civil society believes that it's time to seriously address the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and how we can prevent such a catastrophe from ever happening again. Quanto abbiamo imparato finora? I video che abbiamo visto sono stati a volte crudi e spaventosi, ma come ha detto Aira Helvand, non possiamo dimenticare. Anzi, questo deve essere di sprone per andare avanti e darci da fare. Le organizzazioni ci sono, i movimenti che servono proprio per ritrovarci e rafforzare insieme il nostro desiderio di non restare passivi di fronte a questa minaccia dell'era nucleare. E io dico che è bello terminare con una sorpresa, un breve video a noi inoltrato, da un luogo dove non ci aspettavamo. Lo Stato di Israele, infatti, è stato tra le grandi potenze che hanno disertato la conferenza di Oslo, ma proprio dal movimento israeliano per il disarmo 
Ecco arrivare questo contributo multimediale. Un grido dal popolo, un I can ripetuto con convinzione, nella speranza di convincere anche i propri rappresentanti al governo del Paese. Grazie Sharon. לחיות בעולם בטוח יותר, צודק יותר, עולם ללא נשק גרעיני.